What I'll do is I'll switch to my browser. And once again, like I said, for this tutorial, we're going to start with Bcrypt and we might look into Argon2 after a while. But let's search for Bcrypt first. You're going to find that there's two popular implementations of Bcrypt available on NPM. There's one that is called Bcrypt and there's also one called Bcrypt.js. Now the last release of Bcrypt.js has been three years ago. So it's pretty old, but at the same time, the algorithm hasn't changed in a while. So I would say it's fairly safe to use Bcrypt.js. But if you want to stay up to date, you may want to look into Bcrypt. And the other thing to note is that Bcrypt.js is also going to be slower than Bcrypt. And that's because Bcrypt.js is using a pure JavaScript implementation, whereas Bcrypt uses C++ bindings to speed up the process of hashing. So once again, as the readme indicates, this version is going to be about 30% slower than Bcrypt. Now, both of them have the same limitation of 72 bytes, except with Bcrypt.js, because this version is based on JavaScript, I believe there's no problem with null bytes. So even if you try to pass in a character of null byte, I don't believe it's going to cause any issues because this implementation is purely JavaScript based and it's not using C strings or C++ strings. And one last word of caution, if you want to use the Bcrypt package, be sure to go to the GitHub page and look at the wiki section. And this one is going to give you a bit more information as far as like the installation is concerned. So for example, I'm using Ubuntu. If I wanted to use that package, there is a few packages I would need to install. So because this package relies on NoJip, I'm going to need to have a Python to install, which I don't have out of the box because the version of Ubuntu that I'm using only has Python 3. So there's a few things I'm going to have to install. And if you're using an operating system like Linux, you're probably going to have to install a few packages. And this doesn't only apply to, let's say, a local dev environment, because I realize a lot of you will probably use something like, let's say, a Mac or a Windows. But in many cases, your system is going to be running on Linux in production. So if you're going to be using Bcrypt as a package, be mindful of these things, because there might be a few packages that you do have to install on the system in order to be able to run Bcrypt package with your application. All right, but that's effectively the building phase. What you could do with Docker is you could have an intermediary container where you install all of the dependencies on the system, install Bcrypt, and then transfer all of the node modules to the new system, effectively discarding the old container. So unless there's other dependencies missing, like let's say OpenSSL, you should be fine with this approach. All right, so for this tutorial, we're gonna be installing Bcrypt.js. So I'm gonna switch over to my terminal and going into the API folder, I'm going to install bcrypt.js. Because I'm using TypeScript, I'm also going to install the dev dependency of types slash bcrypt.js. All right, so let's switch back to our project. So we're gonna go ahead and switch to the register controller. And so what we're doing here is we're passing in a plain text password to the user model when we create a new instance. So if we go to the user.ts file, what we could do here is we can set up a pre-save hook. So on the user schema, we're going to do a pre-save hook passing in a traditional function because we're going to need to have access to the this keyword. I'm also going to annotate this function with user document so that it knows what the this keyword is referencing. And we're going to say if the password is modified, so if the password field was modified on the document, we're going to reassign it. So we're going to take in the password or we're simply going to hash it. So we'll pass in the password. The hash function is going to come from bcrypt. So let's import from bcrypt.js. We're going to be importing hash. Okay. Now, if you look at the documentation for bcrypt.js, bcrypt.js already has a hash function that takes in the password and a callback. But if you don't provide a callback, it's going to return back a promise. So what we could do is we can pass in a password and we can also pass in the work factor. If I can look for it, let's say hash. You could pass in the original passphrase, the salt, any callback. Or what you can do is you can call a wait on it and pass in the work factor in here. So we're going to make this function asynchronous. And once again, this is a traditional function because we need to have access to the this keyword. And for the work factor itself, so in a lot of tutorials, you're probably going to see a work factor of 10. And this is really going to determine how many rounds your hash function is going to run the input string with. So a good work factor at the time being is 12. 8 is considered low enough. 10 is quite low as well. So 12 is a good compromise. In fact, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go back to the terminal and I'm going to touch a file. So let's call this one auth.ts and this one's going to be inside of source config. So we're going to have authentication related config variables. So if we switch to config auth.ts, in here I'm going to define a variable. So let's call this one bcrypt work factor. We're going to set this one to 12 and we're going to export the variable. So let's make sure that we also go to config and index.ts file and let's export everything from auth. And with that, we should be able to import the variable, paste it in, let's auto import from config. 
Perfect. So what we can do now is we can open the readme. I have this handy curl command saved up. So if we switch back to the terminal, I'm going to delete the old user. So let me do delete many. Switch back here. So let's paste that in, let's run it. And we get the message of okay, if I try to find the users, this time the password is going to be hashed using bcrypt. So the difference now is that if the database gets leaked to the attacker, they won't be able to compromise user accounts because effectively we don't store the passwords, we store this unique or random looking hash instead in the password field. And in theory, using a strong KDF or using a strong password hashing algorithm, you should not be able to take in the string and reverse it back to the password. So that's basically it for hashing. Now there's one more thing to keep in mind and this one has to do with validation. If we go back to auth.ts, what I'm going to do in fact is I'm going to extract these guys into separate variables. That's the first thing we're gonna do. So let's call this one email and we're just gonna use shorthand notation. Let's also take out the name. Let's have one for the password. And as you can see, we left over a to-do note for password. So let's do password and also password confirmation. So like I was saying, there's two things to keep in mind when it comes to bcrypt. Uh, one is the fact that bcrypt is going Going to choke up on null bytes and the second one is that bcrypt has a limitation of 72 characters so when you have your password you have to make sure that you take in a maximum of 72 characters except that you could provide characters that exceed one byte in length so in utf8 one byte would be let's say a letter an ascii or a digit but in some cases we might have characters that take up more than one byte so these could be for example emojis these could be special letters with accents so for example as in french or in german in some other languages there are letters that are outside the scope of ascii encoding but which are nonetheless valid characters in unicode so instead of checking for the length of the string, so instead of taking in 72 characters in terms of the length of the string, we're gonna take in the length of bytes. So we're gonna supply a second argument of UTF-8 like this. I'm going to take this hard-coded value and I'm actually going to go back to config auth and I'm going to paste it in as a variable. So let's actually export const bcrypt maximum bytes. So this is gonna be 72. We're gonna import that variable instead like this. So to demonstrate why this is important, let's say I switch back to my terminal and I run node. If we had a single character or effectively a string with a single character in it, if we did dot length on it, we're gonna get one. And if we also did buffer dot byte length on that same letter, we're gonna get also one. So effectively one byte in UTF-8 is used to store the A character. Now, if we had an emoji, and if we did length on it, we're gonna get two. So effectively, this symbol is taking up two spaces. So you would expect it to be taking two bytes, but if you did buffer dot byte length on that same emoji, you're gonna see that it's actually taking up four bytes in memory. So this is why if you were simply checking against the length of the string, you will not necessarily always be matching with the length of the string in terms of bytes. So the character count of the input string will in some cases differ from the byte length of that same string. So this is something to be mindful of if we have a limit in terms of bytes. So we have to be careful to interpret the maximum length of that string and not in terms of the characters, but in terms of the input bytes using UTF-8 encoding. And again, if you want to go around this limitation, because I do find that it's kind of confusing or it might be too limiting for your use case or application, what you could also do is you can go back and consider using a hashing algorithm on the passphrase or the password before you pass it into bcrypt. So for example, you can use SHA-256 to hash the password, take out the base64 version of that password and then pass it into bcrypt. So what this could look like is we could have an import of crypto. So let's require crypto. We can have our password. So for example, secret12. We could hash it. So let's say hash would be crypto.createHash passing in SHA-256 as the algorithm to be employed, updating it with the password and taking out the digest in the form of base64. We're gonna get a hash that has a length of 44. And in fact, the output hash will always be at the size of 44. And that's because these hashing functions such as SHA-256 always produce output with the same size. So in this case, it's gonna be the size of 256 bits or 32 bytes. So we take the 32 divided by three, seal that number. So it's gonna be 10.6 sealed. So we could do math.seal on 32 divided by three, we get 11. And then we multiply that 11 by four, we get 44. So again, after the conversion from the original string at the size of 32 bytes, we pass it into base 64 and we get 44 bytes instead. 
So effectively, you could think of this as 44 characters in UTF-8 encoding. And of course, keep in mind that this string cannot be used in the URL because the base64 digest will have special characters like plus, forward slash, and also the equal sign. So once you have that hash, what you could do is you can import bcrypt. So let's require bcrypt.js. We're going to call bcrypt.hash, passing in the hash. So not the original password, but now the hash. Passing in the work factor and also the callback. So I'll just do console log. And we get null because there's been no error and we also get the resulting bcrypt hash and again this hash is based on the sha256 version of the password so effectively this is how you can bypass the 72 bytes limitation of bcrypt if you'd like you could use that approach instead but for the time being i'm going to simply be passing the plain text password and we're going to be hashing it with bcrypt directly and both approaches are fine it's just a matter of do you want to have the 72 bytes limitation on the password. And the last thing you may want to consider is to enforce password strength. So for example, you may want to require that the users pass in, let's say, one lowercase letter, one uppercase, one digit. So with this, we could actually look for a password regex. And I'm going to look at the first result on Stack Overflow. And again, in most cases, that's going to be fine. You just have to be mindful that you don't want to limit the input to ASCII characters. So for example, don't just allow them to pass in uppercase A to uppercase D. You may want to allow them to pass in those same letters with accents. So for example, there could be variations of the A letter, let's say in Dutch language, that has special accents on top of it. So I'm going to use the second answer, which employs look ahead assertions. I'll take out the regex and I'm going to come back here and we're going to use the regex method on joy so i'll paste it in between two forward slashes also adding in u at the end to enable support for unicode as of es 2015 and i'm going to change the uppercase letters to property escape using unicode uppercase letters like this also using a property escape for lowercase letters in unicode and i'll change this to simply backwards d Four digits and we can also remove the last one for special characters. Now as far as the length, we already enforced the length using joy. So we could say any character any number of times like this. And this way, just so we don't expose the regex to the client, what we can do is we can provide a custom message passing in the label saying that the password must contain one uppercase, one lowercase letter, and one digit like this. So effectively, once again, we're using a Unicode property escape. We're enforcing at least one uppercase letter in Unicode, at least one Unicode lowercase letter, and at least one digit. So if we take that, and once again, if I switch back to the terminal, first of all, if I run this with Alex, of course, this is going to fail. Our password needs to have one uppercase letter at least. So let's pass in secret for both the password and the password confirmation. Now the email is invalid because we've put in Alex. So let's say what I'm going to do is I'm going to look for Polish alphabet. All right, and so instead of using a traditional S, I'm going to use this variation of S with an accent. So I'll go ahead and put that in as well. And this should still pass the validation because even though we're not supplying an ASCII S, we're still supplying a valid uppercase letter, which is part of Unicode. And of course, we could do the same thing for lowercase as well. So let's say instead of E, we're going to supply this variation of E. So I'm going to copy that and paste that in, and that should still pass the validation. Once again, it's passing the joy validation, but it's failing at the email address because we've already used it. But let's say if I change this to just one uppercase and one digit, this should fail. And it does. Let's also try a very long string. So this one is of length 73. If we try it, now we get an error that this password must be 72 characters long. But if we remove the period, this will pass. Next, I'm going to use a string, which is of length 38, but which in fact has a buffer dot byte length of 76. So it should fail our validation. So now if I go ahead and delete the old one, paste in the new one and try to supply that. So once again, the length seems to be correct in a sense that it's less than 72 characters, but in fact, it exceeds the byte length of 72, which we're imposing. So if I try to submit that, it's now too long. But if I go ahead and remove just one emoji, it's gonna be 72. So I'm gonna go back and remove just one. If we send that in, now the password is no longer failing because of length. And in fact, it's failing because we're missing one uppercase, one lowercase, and one digit. All right, so that's basically it for passwords. I hope you enjoyed that, and I'll see you next time.